Hello, this is Al Chemicolic here. I'm going to discuss an interesting molecule today. This will be the first video that I'm doing related to science, uh, specifically chemistry. The molecule that we're talking about is crystal violet, which is a common dye molecule. And it is, it's used for a lot of different things, but uh, it has, it can be used for fabrics and stuff, and it's also used in labs for a variety of purposes. And it's useful because the color can change under certain conditions. My first uh, exposure to this molecule was in a class for uh, general chemistry in the lab. And we did a reaction with, uh, hyd with sodium hydroxide in order to make the color go away. And we did this under a few different conditions in order to figure out how the process worked at the molecular level based off of things that we could measure about it. And so now I'm, I'm gonna walk through how we know about the structure of this molecule from a few different uh, spectroscopic techniques, um, including infrared spectroscopy, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which is related to how an MRI works, but is actually the thing which preceded MRI machines, and also uh, mass spectroscopy. So um, just a brief look first at the <laughs> molecule. The name, the official name is 444 tris dimethyl amino triphenyl methane. It's a bit of a mouthful, but a pictures worth a thousand words, and here you go. At the very center of this molecule is a carbon, with which has four bonds, three of them going off to these other groups, and one to a hydrogen. That's the thing referred to as a methane. The groups that are attached to it directly are phenyl groups. And there are three of them, so it's triphenyl. But they are modified. And that is what this part refers to, tristimethylamino. The modification on each of these is that at the four position relative to where these are attached, so there's this is maybe one, two, three, four. The fourth position on each of these is a nitrogen, which is amino. And on that nitrogen for each of these groups are two more methyl groups, which are the CH3s, a carbon with three hydrogens. So we have dimethyl amino. And they're tristimethyl amino because the nitrogen is on the fourth position. And there are three of these things attached to the, you know, one on each of the phenyl groups. They're all attached to this carbon right here. Rather complicated name, but it's an interesting structure. Now, this particular structure that we're looking at here is under the most acidic conditions because it has this hydrogen right here. If the pH raises slightly, that's when the color will change from yellow to, to violet. And that happens because this hydrogen is liberated making this uh, slightly charged 
uh, it'll have a positive charge. But what that allows for is for a double bond to form between this central carbon and a ring. And then it causes the other bonds to shift around and essentially results in that little positive charge being distributed over all of these other atoms here in this ring and all the nitrogen. And it, it even links up with this ring and this nitrogen and this ring and this nitrogen. And because all of these things are bound together in this way, and they all have these, uh, they call it resonance. The electrons are able to easily move around in these structures, you know, um, the, the bonds between them are all um, fairly even. Um, it, it allows for this to absorb a lot of energy and it results in the violet color being produced. So specifically here, so this is an absorbent spectrum for crystal violet. And you see, it, it's not that it absorbs in this area, it absorbs all of this. The absorption happens in the orange and yellow and green and and into the blue. Um, and because of that, our eye is going to interpret it as violet because of all the other color that is getting absorbed out of it. So this is our first uh, first one of the spectroscopy things that we're going to look at with this molecule. And two peaks really stand out here. The first is at a mass, uh, mass to charge ratio of 373. And uh, so this is, this is coming from a bit of an older machine where this uh, was initially published. So it doesn't have the uh, the data for like a smaller ions, but it is, uh, or, or rather, a more precise is I guess what I mean. But the three seventy three is the total mass of the whole molecule. So here we have uh, one, two, three, four, five six, seven, eight, um, eight carbons, a nitrogen, and three, six, ten hydrogens in each one of these. So there's ten hydrogens, twenty, thirty, thirty-one hydrogens, and there are twenty-five carbons, and then there are three nitrogens. And that adds up to like 373.5. Um, and you would be able to determine what the mass or what this, um, like the number of carbons, hydrogens, and you know other elements through other techniques, just through different kinds of like a, a combustion reaction. Like if you if you made it react with uh, oxygen under heat, you'd be able to get some information about that. Um, which you, so you would know when you went and did this mass spec experiment that, okay, this is, that's how big the molecule is. I guess I should note what it is that a mass spec tells us. A mass spectrometer is an instrument in which uh, a molecule that you're trying to sample or you know an analyte is put into an unstable state where an electron has been knocked out of it. 
will destabilize the molecule by, you know, putting this under a large voltage or will um, we'll shoot an, some kind of uh, charged atom at it. There's a, a lot of different techniques they use um, and have used over the years to do this, but you're going to try to destabilize the molecule. Regardless of what technique that you use is that the molecule will break up into pieces and one of the pieces will have a positive charge and the other piece will have an extra electron but will otherwise be neutral. And the positively charged ions are the ones that can make it through the instrument in the magnetic field and then will hit the detector. Whereas the ones that gain the electron and are neutral will not make it to the detector. Uh, we see that there's a lot of small things that show up and they're at you know a variety of different masses. Uh, but the most important things are right here at 253 and 373. That's a difference of 120. Um, and that transition right here tells us that the dominant way that this molecule fragments is such that it loses 120 uh, Daltons or atomic units. It's essentially relates to the mass of the uh, of the atoms. So if we look at this whole thing, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. Each one of them having a mass of 12 uh, Daltons is 96. This nitrogen has a mass of 14. That puts us at 110. And then we have three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hydrogens, that each one of being uh, approximately one. You know, all of these things really have another 0.01 on them. But we were at 110, we have 10 hydrogens, that puts us at 120. So the dominant fragmentation that happens in the mass spec for crystal violet is cleavage of one of these bonds. Now, all of these are the same, so it doesn't matter if it cleaves here or here or here. They're equivalent to each other. The molecule is totally symmetrical. Um, if we go, the, the rings themselves are flat, but the hydrogens in the methyl groups come off in different directions. And around that central carbon, uh, in a case like this, where, you know, with, with what is shown in this particular image, um, there's no hydrogen in the center. It's, it's been knocked out by, uh, by the change in pH, um, these will all be in a single plane, they'll be flat. But when you do have the hydrogen, they will all sort of be oriented in the same direction, um, slightly off center. Um, kind of like, like a pyramid, but maybe not, uh, not as much of a slope as on a pyramid. Again, we'll, we'll, we can cleave any of these bonds, but when we do cleave this, the, the, this is the piece that is 120 that gets lost. And the remaining, the remainder is this 253. 
and that's what we see here. The next technique here, this is something called infrared spectroscopy. And uh, the idea with infrared spectroscopy is that we're going to expose a sample to some infrared light and we will start at a low frequency and you know a, like a lower energy infrared light and increase and increase and increase um getting to you know higher energy infrared light and we see which we uh, we want to measure how much of the light gets absorbed. So that will tell us about the nature of the bonds in the molecule. Now, infrared light is a lower energy light. Uh, in the whole uh, spectrum, uh, light, light spectrum, while uh, ultraviolet light and x-rays and gamma rays are higher energy. Infrared is lower energy. The, w while uh, an ultraviolet photon is going to have enough energy that it might be able to even uh, to break a bond in a molecule. Infrared light does not do that. Um, infrared is what we commonly think of as heat. It is the uh, light in the sort of frequency and uh, wavelength that is required to cause vibrations to happen in the bonds of molecules. And we can make predictions about the bonds of molecules based off their structures, if we know the structure, but we can also take measurements of the uh, absorption of infrared light in order to find out what kind of structures exist in a molecule. Now, if we look over here, this is, these, this is the higher energy, higher frequency, uh, zone or region, and this is a lower frequency region. It's less energy in these. So when we first start uh, pulsing infrared light at our sample, we'll be in this region here, and we measure how much of the light passes through. So it's most of the light down here is passing through and a lot of it, most of it, most of it. And then we get up to here to this point and suddenly only about half of the light is passing through because a bunch of that light is getting absorbed. And some light gets absorbed here and some gets absorbed here. And then we start to see some additional peaks here, stronger peaks where more light gets absorbed. And then there's a little there, little bump, and then more up here. 
Now, as I was pointing out before, these things, where light gets absorbed, is characteristic of types of bonds. So, the bonds down in this region, it takes less energy to cause these bonds to begin to vibrate, whereas bonds up here require more energy to cause to vibrate. And that is something which is characteristic of those. Down here, uh, we see the different frequencies and we also see what the, uh, the transmittance is at each frequency. And we will take a look at, at that and what that means as far as this molecule and uh, what it is that we can sort of identify feature-wise uh, about the molecule from the uh, IR spec spectrum here. Um, but first, a, a brief, I'm going to step over to a figure made by uh, compound interest or compound chemistry, which is uh, helpful for understanding some of the different bands. So over here, around 3000 uh, wave number, which is the, the number, you, the particular unit used for frequency in IR spectra. This is the place where we have our peaks over in this area. And we see a carbon hydrogen stretch frequency for alkanes. We also see something for alkenes and aromatics in this area around 3000, which is slightly, uh, it's slightly higher energy than for the alkanes. In the middle, we have things like carbon, a carbon nitrogen triple bond and a carbon to carbon triple bond for alkynes and nitriles. Around 1600 to 1800, this is where we have a lot of double bonds. Um, carbon oxygen for carbonyls organic acids, anhydrides, acyl chloride, esters, amides. We also have um, in this, around this area, double bonds for alkenes and uh, and then the aromatic carbon-carbon uh, bonds would be around here as well. But in rule I guess the something that we'll note is that aromatics, if we should identify what an aromatic is, so I'm going to backtrack in the slides a little bit. This uh, structure here, what we call a phenyl group, is itself the sort of uh, prime example of what an aromatic uh, structure is, where we, the way it is displayed has alternating double and single bonds in the structure. But in reality, all of these bonds are the same as each other, and they are stronger than single bonds but not as strong as a normal double bond. It's like they're all one and a half bonds. A 
double bond is going to is uh, has more electrons shared between the two carbon atoms. Well, between any two atoms that are in it, uh, than for just a single bond. But the like the key thing about aromatic structures is that the uh, the electrons that are being shared on additionally uh, beyond just the single bonds that are between each of the atoms and their neighbors, they're really able to circulate. And they're not just connected to one neighbor. They call and that's that's part of resonance and, and that relates to the thing we identified earlier where if we charge this molecule by knocking out this hydrogen that all of these atoms end up connected to each other which gives it the color that we associate with it so these bonds here the carbon carbon bonds are not going to be as flexible as a single bond and they're not going to be as stiff as a double bond and that relates to where they end up showing uh, appearing in an infrared spectrum so we see here the aromatic carbon carbon stretching bonds and that would be between the atoms that are in the ring. And we see alkenes, which are normal carbon-carbon double bonds. And we see these ones are just a little bit easier. It's a bit less energy required in order to make these atoms stretch versus a normal double bond. And that's because they're just a bit weaker. The bond is, is not as stiff as a carbon, normal carbon-carbon double bond. And I say that they're not as stiff, but they're very, very stable as structures. And down here is where we see normal alkanes with carbon-hydrogen bonds. And um, we also see the carbon-hydrogen bonds over here. But, and then, does anything else show up here that, that seems particularly important? Um, I guess I'll, I'll note here that this whole thing this whole region is called the fingerprint region. And that's because the subtle differences in what peaks show up for a given molecule are very distinct in this region. And if you have an unknown sample and you analyze it with infrared spectroscopy, you can often identify it based off of the specific peaks that are in this region, while something like the, the concentration or certain things about how it's been prepared might affect the particular intensities you see in this region. Uh, an example here is with carboxylic acids. If you have a, an organic acid like vinegar or something, these the peaks for something like this tend to be very large and you know broad, but very strong and very apparent. And it would definitely tell you that that particular kind of uh, bond is present, like that you have 
the carboxylic acid, same molecule. But if you prepare the sample one way or another way, it will impact how strongly it absorbs in that area because you have uh, the possibility of, of getting double uh, hydrogen bonds forming between these molecules and other ones of themselves or with uh, if, if it's in water that they can hydrogen bond with the water and hydrogen bonds are intram or intermolecular bonds but they're very they're particularly strong bonds and the bonds between one molecule and another molecule can end up influencing how much energy it takes to stretch them how much energy it takes to make them begin to vibrate Whereas these things down here in the fingerprint region, they're not going to be as subject to change from things like that. So here I've noted a few of the important peaks within uh, our molecule, you know, crystal violet. And so first we'll start with this, the 1614, um, where we have a weak carbon-carbon double bond signal, um, something in the aromatic uh, region. Now, if it was a much stronger peak, you know, if we didn't know what we were analyzing, um, and we saw a much stronger peak, we wouldn't necessarily think that it was aromatic. But the fact that it's kind of weak is one of the things that indicates that. Um, down here around 793, this peak is something that, and it's a fairly strong peak here, is indicative of having an aromatic ring with substitutions on opposite sides of it. They call that a para-substitution, uh, P-A-R-A, para. And it's, you know, the, the presence of this peak is something that helps us to know what the placement of the substitutions on our aromatic structure is. If instead we saw uh, there's like a, a certain trio of peaks in, uh, in this area, it could be maybe like a peak here and here and then another one down at like 600. Um, it would indicate that we had something like a mono-substituted aromatic. You just had one thing on a ring. Um, or if the ring was like at the end of the chain or something. But that's not what we see. We see this peak here at 793. Um, I've also noted 1519. Um, and that's because I believe that this peak is in resonance with the 793, meaning that it's, um, it's a higher energy peak that is showing up through, like, additional vibration of the same bond and same type, um, just at a higher frequency and it's because of the like if you, if you double 1493 you get 15 um 1586 and that's relatively close here I mean, 
maybe maybe this right here that's 1564 that that might be more of the resonant peak resonance peak for this um i th actually i think the the word i mean is overtone it's an overtone of that um and if if anybody's familiar with music then you would understand that uh, overtones can occur of a with you know, if you have like a, a low frequency to a higher frequency you have additional overtones um, and that's something that we can sort of innately pick up on but it also occurs in the fused drama strain that eventually as the sound decays, it produces additional overtones and uh, other frequencies. And, um, and you can get that here in infrared uh, spectroscopy when you, you are trying to cause these vibrations to occur and we can end up getting additional overtones of vibrations within the molecule. Uh, over here, very, very substantial uh, absorption in this region. Um, the, uh, the box here indicates that these are at 2966, 2925, and 2855. And these here are all corresponding to carbon hydrogen stretching frequencies. So the uh, there are really only a couple types that are present in this molecule because it has a lot of symmetry. Each of the carbon hydrogen uh, methyl groups, right? So we have six of these methyl groups all of those hydrogens are equivalent to each other. So they'll be one of these peaks. Additionally, we have uh, this carbon hydrogen bond that's in the center, which is just a single hydrogen. And it's unique relative to all the other ones. On each ring, we have a carbon hydrogen, and they don't show these hydrogens because it would make it annoying to write out the structure. Um, it's a common thing in organic chemistry to sort of leave off hydrogens unless they're at the end of something like this. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, six that are going to be identical to each other. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, six more that are in these structures. And those, those are likely to be pretty close to these six as well. Um, though we'll see when we look at the NMR spectrum that it's not the case for that but for a different reason. So that's 12, uh, 12 hydrogens here, and then there's the 18 hydrogens there, and a singular hydrogen there. And that's what these three peaks are gonna be. And if we step back a moment over here, we'll see that we have the aromatic carbon hydrogen bonds and the alkane carbon hydrogen bonds. And the aromatic ones are going to be the strongest ones then, the, the ones that require the most energy to begin to vibrate. So that'll be these bonds right here on these rings for the, the carbon-hydrogen bonds. 
and then the next one, the next peak is going to be for the alkane bonds, and that there is going to be these for each of these methyl groups. We have a bunch of hydrogens, and these are all going to, you know, after being uh, given some energy, there's a pretty significant amount of energy, those will begin to vibrate. And then the, uh, the last one of these peaks here, the, the carbon hydrogen, we see peak right here. Now, I'll, I'll note here at this point that the uh, absorption and, and transmittance, the, the amount of light that gets absorbed, doesn't really indicate for us how many of these kinds of atoms there are present in the molecule. It only tells us about how strongly it absorbs that light. In NMR, it is different from that, but that is not the case here. Um, so certain bonds in a given molecule might very strongly absorb light. Um, you know, it, you say 1800, if you had a, like a carbon-oxygen double bond, it might really, really strongly absorb it there. Meaning that that carbon-oxygen double bond is very uh, excitable when the frequency is right. And if we had an, uh, a hydroxyl group, like an, an OH, like in the molecule ethanol, we'd see a very wide band of absorption. It'd be very, very good at absorbing light, but in a rather imprecise way, just sort of over a band, and that's because of hydrogen bonding. But it doesn't really tell us about how many bonds how many uh, of these atoms are present. Um, there's one little feature over here that's potentially of interest. If we look around 2000 uh, wave number, we should see some kind of bump. What, what do we see here? It, it sort of drops to Let me see, 1229, 1651, 1664 is at 72. Um, it doesn't really, 1887 and 86. I don't know if that, 1887 might be what we're looking at here. It's a very weak thing, and it's sort of spread out. And while I've not noted it, um, that is possibly related to the carbon-nitrogen uh, fre stretching frequency. Nothing is in this particular chart, but um, the, I don't think we see anything else in this chart, in, chart here that is for the carbon nitrogen. Um, do we see a different, do we see something for carbon oxygen? Just sort of look around. It's only the carbon oxygen double bond. But uh, if you recall the, the structure of our molecule here, uh, this nitrogen is attached to three different carbons, one of which is aromatic, but does not have any bonds to hydrogen, and this molecule doesn't have any oxygen in it. Um, okay, anyway. Um, 
that's probably enough for the infrared spectroscopy. So I'll move on. Um, this next technique here is called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. This occurs at an even much lower energy light than is used for infrared spec. NMR is done using radio waves. And while we were able to use the uh, infrared light to cause whole bombs to vibrate, um, when we use NMR, what we're causing is the uh, subatomic particles, you know, the, the, and by that I specifically mean the, the protons and neutrons to change the direction of their spin. So that is something that happens at a much lower energy. Um, and we, we take the sample and we put it in a strong magnetic field and we pulse radio waves at it. And like with the IR spec, we'll scan across a range of frequencies and essentially look for the point when the the pulse of radio waves at, is at a f frequency that causes the, uh, the nucleons to come into resonance with the magnetic field. And that will allow them to produce a signal. And this can be done in a, a variety of ways and the, the timing of the pulses affects uh, different things that you can end up finding out about molecules. But the, uh, the signals tell us here about the bonds and about the structure and how things are arranged in our molecule. And so if you see here, I've, I've, I've noted something about shielding. Now, the general idea of shielding is that around each of the atoms in the molecule, all of the atoms are electrons. Around hydrogens, there's just a single electron. And around carbon, it's got six electrons on its own. Um, when hydrogen forms a bond with something else, it'll have two electrons through the bond. Um, things like oxygen and nitrogen have more electrons on them and are, uh, have a, a draw, they pull electron density towards themselves. Um, the, the spin of the electrons around each atom in a molecule produces a magnetic field as well. And that magnetic field is going to sort of oppose the magnetic field that we put the molecule in for the experiment. 
And the result of that is that if a given uh, a given nucleus within the whole molecule is more shielded by the electrons and the density of electrons around it, then it will take more energy to cause it to come into resonance with the magnetic field. So, as complicated as this molecule is, this NMR spectrum is rather simple. And that's because of a number of things, but importantly, this is just proton NMR, which is the most basic kind of NMR. We have, remember, these six methyl groups, which are all equivalent to each other. And we have this single hydrogen here. And then we have four hydrogens on each of the phenyl groups. However, the hydrogens that are closer to this carbon in the center, there are six of them, are similar, or they're equivalent to each other and the six that are closer to the nitrogen are equivalent to each other. So by that count, there are really four different things to identify here. Firstly, the place, a very, very common uh, thing that we see in NMR, and it's very, very recognizable, is down here. Here we see between, uh, you know, greater than six and a half and around like seven uh, ppm. I'm not going to get into the explanation here of what ppm means other than that in on the far left you're looking at things that are uh let's see i want to say that they are the most shielded here and they're i think a, I think I actually wrote this wrong here. Um, I think that they, they're either the most shielded or the most deshielded here, and down here is at the, the other end. But um, I'll, I'll need to, to check that. But um, The peaks that show up down in this region here are characteristic often of aromatic molecules. And peaks down here are characteristic of things that are in alkanes. So that would be like a, a carbon hydrogen bond um, you know, or, or rather just hydrogens that are bound to carbons, but um, specifically, this is very, very large peak. And showing up here at, or, you know, 2.9 ppm or so, and it's not split, this peak right here, if we were to be able to measure how much area is present in here and compare that to the area present in these, 
it should come out to be something like 18, you know, as a ratio to the other things. And that's because this peak right here, this single peak, is going to correspond with the hydrogens in our methyl groups. And they're all equivalent to each other. So they, they just have one peak. And the, uh, the reason that they show up here and not further down, like a normal, a normal methyl group, the hydrogens will show up here around one. Uh, but here they're at three, and that's because each of the methyl groups is attached to a nitrogen. And that nitrogen, with its own extra pool of electrons, is going to affect the magnetic field that those other uh, atoms experience. So nitrogen being uh, an electron withdrawing, or it's, you know, it's an electron, it's electronegative. So it, it will pull electron density towards itself within a molecule. Here, I'll move on so that you can see. Um, and it sort of pulls electrons towards itself from the carbons it will result in the hydrogens that are in those methyl groups having less of an effective shield against the magnetic field from their own electrons because they've been sort of pulled towards the carbon and towards the nitrogen. So that's, that's those, that's um, the peak at 2.897 or 2.9. If we go to this other place here, around 5.3, 5.4, this is a fairly small peak, and that's going to correspond to our carbon-hydrogen bond in the center. OK, so they said 5.3. Now, that is pretty unshielded. You know, we, we just saw that each of these hydrogens that's attached to nitrogen, that only puts them at, at you know, three. This hydrogen here is in a very special position because the carbon is attached to three different aromatic groups, each of them producing their own special magnetic environment. And so the electrons of these bonds here are very much involved with each of these independent rings. And so this hydrogen is fairly isolated. And the magnetic field on that is affected by the magnetic fields of all three phenyl groups which is not true of the hydrogens that are in these methyls. And so that, that has a very significant effect on where that little peak shows up, even though it's just one small peak. Next, we see here the uh, peaks related to our ortho and meta positions of, for the hydrogens. Now, here is nitrogen. Now, on this ring, we have four hydrogens, we have a nitrogen, and then we have a bond to a carbon. Now, the bonds, the bond doesn't look like this. It's not that long, and the bonds don't line up like that. All these bonds are the same length as each other, and they're 
fairly close to the bond length of these, but maybe a little longer. They're not extraordinarily different. This is just for convenience to see the, the shape and to be able to compare it to that. But um, we have a, a bond here that's to something that isn't a hydrogen and a bond here. And the nitrogen is the more novel atom to be bound to so that and it, it is because it's different from carbon. All of these atoms here are carbon. This is carbon, that's carbon. The nitrogen is different. The nitrogen has more electrons than carbon. And it is able to interact differently with this aromatic ring than the carbon over here does. So when we look at the positions in this ring, we're concerned with where things are relative to the nitrogen. So this is our first position here. These, the things that are immediately next to it, are in the ortho position. The thing across from it is para. I mentioned that word earlier. We have a para substituted benzene ring, this or phenyl group, um, because the substitution is on opposite sides of the ring. And this position right here is called meta. It's meta relative to this. Now, There, we have an effect that appears where we have two different peaks appearing. And each of these peaks is actually a doublet. So what we have is a doublet of doublets. And the doublet of doublets in this region where aromatic NMR signals show up is indicative of a para substituted ring. And the meta position is the more unshielded position on the ring. Now, it's not, uh, it's not necessarily going to be easy to explain why, but I'll give it a shot. If we, if we look at this nitrogen, now this nitrogen has extra electrons on it. It has an extra electron pair that don't have a bond right now. If it were to take its extra electron pair and create a double bond with this carbon in the ring, the result would be that this would be a double bond, this would have to be a double bond, and this, and then this could be a double bond. This hydrogen would have to get cut out to do that. This nitrogen would have a positive charge in this particular structure. Um, so on the way to doing that, you know, if we put this double bond here, before we go changing all the bonds, Putting a double bond here means that this double bond or this double bond break and becomes they just become single bonds for a moment. And they'll have an extra pair of electrons right here. Because they've a new bond's formed here. So we'll get an electron pair there or an electron pair there. 
and then things can sort of begin shifting around in order to accommodate that and eventually you know, have it all on over here. And it contributes, it'll, it'll be like a weakening of this bond in the resin structures. Um, and the fact that this can happen in all of the rings contributes to why this hydrogen is so easily able to get rid of or be, be gotten rid of. Um, but an important note, an important thing why this matters is that that sort of point where you have electrons building up here and here, it won't make it here. The you have electrons here and then they, they can become a double bond, but that just puts the electrons here that are extra. So the ortho and para positions all end up more shielded when the nitrogen does this than the meta positions. The meta positions are different from these positions. And the result is that these hydrogens are even more unshielded than these ones. And that is what we have here. Now, in NMR, something occurs called a signal splitting. And that's, you know, here we have these doublets, okay? The signal splitting occurs because, say, say we start with this hydrogen, okay? We're gonna pulse IR, not IR, we're gonna pulse radio frequency light at our sample. And we can hit the whole sample. And it'll be a lot of molecules of this, but, um, and it will begin to interact with some of the nuclei, but not all of them. But if this nucleus has been switched and this one has been switched, it will affect, or I guess maybe not that one. If this has been switched, it will affect how easily this one is able to change its spin. Likewise, if this one is changed, it will affect how easily this one is changed. And that happens the other direction as well. So when we look at this, at the peak right here, the uh, where we have two little peaks next to each other, the A's will have a peak that is for when the adjacent B uh, hydrogen is uh, already uh, has already absorbed the the photon or the, the you know the pulse of light and flipped direction and if it has not flipped direction so two different possibilities but it only has one adjacent neighbor like that this one only has one adjacent neighbor like that so it is only going to be affected by whether it's one neighbor is or isn't two peaks. For signal B at 
0.659. It only matters whether A is or isn't spinning in the reverse direction, you know, whether it's come into resonance with the magnetic field. And because of that, we see a splitting on this peak as well. This hydrogen is not in resonance with what is happening in the rings. So it does not get split. And this one here, there is not any apparent splitting happening in these hydrogens because they are all equivalent. And whether they, uh, it occurs to them or not ends up being averaged out by the number of them that are there. They're all effectively under the same conditions, whereas the ortho and meta hydrogens are not rel um, relative to each other compared to what's in these. The, uh, the next thing I'm not going to go too far into, but this is in a different type of NMR spectrum. And you'll see that the, the PPM here is much larger. And that's because here we're looking at carbon-13. And... Um, and so we're pulsing still just radio frequency waves, but uh, under you know different different range, and we want to see about the resonance of the carbon atoms that are in the molecule relative to their uh, to their environment within the molecule, and that can tell us things like if we're looking at a, a single carbon uh, a carbon you know that's bonded to no other carbon or a carbon that's bonded to only other carbons and how many hydrogens they each have so here um and i'll i'll flip back to the uh, previous Thing so that you can see the different signals. They are in order of the, uh, you know, for the, for the field from left field to right field. Um, and it also shows us the intensity. And so they have the highest intensity at 129 ppm, and they have, they've assigned it to uh, carbon number three, which is the carbon that has the meta hydrogens on it. And they're indicating that, that those six have a you know, higher intensity signal at, at that. But I guess it's maybe uh, more interesting to note the uh, the shielding, um, and let's see if that makes the most makes sense. So here, the most shielded within the molecule are the methyls. They show that here as all these sixes. Okay, they're just individual carbons and. Now, unlike with hydrogens, remember the hydrogens became deshielded, and that's because the nitrogen, with its electron density, is able to sort of pull on the carbons, and it deshields the hydrogens. The carbon attached to the nitrogen doesn't really become less shielded 
not the same way. Um, but compared to the effects of the resonance within the aromatic structures, these carbons are definitely way more shielded than any of the others. Then if we go to the middle carbon, that's been assigned for the next peak, and that's also just a normal carbon hydrogen, except that it is adjacent to all three of these rings. And so it experiences a deshielding effect, some, you know, deshielding effect from each of those. Now, I'll note here that if this is one, it's two, three, four, five, six, there are six methyl groups. And this is approximately six to one for the size. And that would make sense that the intensity of this peak would be that much higher than the intensity of this peak. Next, the next assignment here has been to the uh, the four position, the uh, the carbons that are ortho to the position where the nitrogen is bound to the ring. And I would be hard pressed here to identify exactly why that would be, but the next position here, three, uh, three, four, um, if these six carbons are for the meta position and these six are for the ortho position, that would be uh, similar to what we see here where the meta position was less uh, shielded and so the signal for these ended up further upstream to here, just like here. Whereas the orthos were here and here. The next signal is at 134 or so. 133.76. They assign that to the position uh, immediately at the center, where the position where these rings attach to the center carbon. And I suppose that the case for these being uh, highly unshielded might have something to do with the ability to interact across these rings. Um, it also may have something to do with their position relative to the nitrogen, nitrogen over here. Um, But I don't, I don't know precisely for that. Um, so there's, there's two, and, and again, one, the one position um, is immediately adjacent to the nitrogen and within the ring. And it, I guess it's interesting to me that the, uh, the carbons that are the most shielded are attached to the nitrogen, and the carbon that is the least shielded is also attached to the nitrogen. Um, but this here, the, the carbon-nitrogen bond is definitely a very polar bond. The nitrogen would 
have a pull of electrons away from the carbon. That would certainly make sense for this carbon being less shielded. Um, I don't, uh, with, with the limitations around the computer, I, I'm not really able to parse exactly how electrons are going to flow in order to make it so that this is very unshielded or very deshielded. Um, but I'm, I'm not surprised by any of the assignments here for, uh, for these peaks. Um, anyway, it's not, uh, not trying to go too far in depth with this particular uh, spectrum, but um, what you can tell within something like this is information about what kinds of carbons are present. So like with the uh, other NMR spectrum, having signals in a particular area can tell you if they're aromatic. Um, Having them in a different area will tell you if they're attached to a nitrogen or an oxygen or something um, like here. Um, there are also, you know, peaks we would expect to see if we had something like a, a nitrogen-hydrogen bond, a, a oxygen-hydrogen bond, but in here, and you know, if we saw other uh, types of bonds we, we might expect particular things to show up. Um, that the carbons that are present in an alcohol molecule or vinegar or something or carbons that are in an organic acid are going to have different degrees of shielding compared to each other that are characteristic. And we can use this information from a carbon-13 NMR experiment to tell us about what kinds of carbons are in a molecule. And we can use an, a hydrogen NMR experiment to tell us about what kinds of hydrogens are present, you know, when, what are the hydrogens attached to? How many neighbors do they have? Now, we, we only saw the splitting right here, but if we had additional neighbors to our methyl groups, if it was in, if they were all ethyl groups instead, then we would see split uh, signals for this for the methyl group part and also for a CH2 part and they would be split because the carbons in the CH2 have three different neighbors in a methyl and the carbons in the methyl have the two different neighbors in the CH2 and it might seem like a complicated jump but that results in seven different peaks showing up. And, but it's like this, it's only, you have one peak that gets split into four and a peak that gets split into three. And it all has to do with the combinations of neighbors and, and how the neighbors are interacting with the magnetic field and the radio pulse. We can combine all of the information from these NMR experiments both the carbon-13 and the hydrogen, with information from something like this from an infrared spectrum in order to tell us about what kinds of bonds are present in the molecule. Um, if we 
know from a uh, from something like this that there is an alcohol present, then we would expect to see a band in here, you know, a, a particular kind of signal that will tell us, ah, yes, that's definitely an OH that's present. And then we would be able to identify that more easily here. We do see this particular splitting of signals and that tells us that this is a para-substituted aromatic ring that is present within the structure of the molecule. And when we look at this, we can see a signal that is, I mean, it, to anyone who's not had the experience of, you know, looking at these very much, it may just be a bundle of, a bundle of noise, but this peak is meaningful if you have the experience, and it can, it would help confirm something about what's in the molecule. And these peaks here are indicative of the molecule being aromatic. And not, it, this is important, that it's aromatic and it doesn't have a carbon-oxygen double bond. It doesn't have triple bonds. It doesn't have a bunch of other things. It doesn't have an alcohol or uh, any NH bonds. We know that this molecule is C25H31N3, and we can see, because of what peaks are here and aren't here, that this molecule has no nitrogen-hydrogen bonds. Because there are things that we expect that we're going to see that are not here at all. So ultimately, all of these different types of experiments and other ones that I've not talked about today here give us information we can use in order to sort of piece together a molecule. And while we've been looking at something very specific and something that we know, it is possible to do this in the reverse direction. And we can start with a molecule and that we don't know what the structure is. And we can determine the structure by looking at the infrared spectrum and figuring out, ah, okay, we have certain functional groups like amines and alcohols and double bonds between this, you know, carbon and carbon or carbon and oxygen. And we look at the NMR spectra and we can say, ah, okay, the hydrogens have neighbors that are of this particular type or, you know, they have this many neighbors to each other. And we can figure out the order of the molecule, of the, the atoms in the molecule through NMR. Knowing already what the functional groups are from the infrared, that makes it a lot easier. And then um, here, with mass spec, we didn't really touch on all the, you know, the important things with mass spec that you can do, because for this molecule, it's fairly simple. But the 
information that you get out of MESPIC is really important because it tells you, okay, we tend to cleave here, or we tend to cleave here, we tend to cleave here. And it gives you information about the structure of the molecule. If you know that the commonly sized fragment is 120, and the other is 253, or 253, or 253, it means that there's a lot of symmetry in the molecule. It doesn't produce many other fragments. If you solve 15, 15, 15, 15, that helps to identify the methyl group. And if we saw a chain in a mass spec that went 15, uh, 27, 39, did it say 27, 39? I don't think that's white, right? I think it's maybe 41. Um, if you see like a, a series of peaks and they're evenly spaced, it can tell you that you have a chain of carbon atoms in your molecule that each have hydrogens on them. And there's all kinds of interesting structural information that you can get. And peaks of things like 77 tell you, okay, I have seven carbon atoms, something like that. Seven, car seven carbon atoms and eight hydrogen atoms, or, you know, the, or seven hydrogen atoms. That's, that's a common structure, C7H7, that can show up in a mass spec, and it tells you about the structure of the molecule. And if you see 77 show up, as a significant peak, it tells you about your molecule. It gives you information that you can use to predict its structure when you have other information. That is my uh, talk here today for Crystal Violet. 444 Trist dimethylamino triphenylmethane. It's a beautiful molecule, and it's pretty to see in person, too. It has an interesting structure, and it has a lot of interesting chemistry, including some stuff that I haven't even talked about today. But maybe I'll talk about more of the other chemistry involved with this in a later video. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. This is Alchemicolic, and this is my ASDMR. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe. And I'm happy to hear any feedback um, on the video. Um, hope to sit with you next time to talk about more science and other stuff that is of interest. Um, thank you.